Hey everybody and welcome back to the Airworthy second channel where we can talk about low pressure topics with minimal fuss. And in today's video, I want to talk about sample rates and 44.1K versus 48K and which one's the best, when to use, what, what, and all of that. So this has been almost a voodoo or taboo topic in the digital audio engineering community for a long time for whatever reason. But the answer is really simple for most of us, to be honest. So with that said, what exactly is sample rate? Well, it's a very simple thing. When audio comes into your audio interface, your audio interface draws in these little dots at regular intervals. And then when it tries to play the audio back, it connects the dots, which you can obviously see from the lines in between each dot. And that is the process of digital sampling. So when you are in a 48K session, what it is saying is every second that passes, your audio interface is going to track 48,000 of these dots, okay? And similarly, a 44.1K session means that every second that passes, 44,100 of these dots are going to be recorded and or played back. Now that's a pretty simple and quick explanation of sample rates. If you want to know more, please be sure to subscribe to the Airworthy main channel, link in the description. We'll be doing a short masterclass on sample rates and general audio theory very soon. So now with an understanding of samples and sample rates in mind, you can likely guess what happens when you try and squeeze a 48K sample into a 44.1 session. The door obviously doesn't like it, so it tries to cut some of those excess samples out, turning your 48K file into a 44.1 file. This is called downsampling. Now, downsampling is pretty easy for most doors, and they do it without losing much audio quality. Oh, but upsampling, on the other hand, that is where they begin to struggle. When Ableton Live sees a 44.1K sample, while it's in a 48k session, it starts to sweat a little bit. It says, boss, there's some stuff missing here. What do I do? But we as the producers, the boss, don't want to think about fancy terms like upsampling and big numbers like 44.1k. We're just here to make beats. So Ableton tries to be a good little employee and make us happy by doing this all behind the scenes. It will try and guess and synthesize where the missing 3,900 samples are and where they are meant to go, and it will try and add them in, synthesize it itself. The real big problem comes in that it does a good enough job that you likely won't notice it, but not good enough that it will not damage your mix. But let's say you have both, which to use? Well, you see, I can sit here and give silly analogies all day, but as usual, the proof is in the pudding. And to get our proof, we are going to do a null test. Now, a null test involves two audio tracks in which one of them has their phase flipped. This causes the waveforms of each track to negatively interact and break each other down. Anything that is identical between the two will cancel itself out, leaving only the difference behind. You can see and hear this happen with the snare sample. We've got a duplicate over here. And if we start by just playing the snare on its own, we can see that it reads at negative six dB. If we enable the other one, they should double jumping up to around zero dB. And finally, if we invert the phase on one of them, they should completely cancel each other out. As you can see, we have audio coming in here, but nothing reaches the master because when they sum together with their phase flipped on the one, they cancel out. You can even see this change. If I drag and offset one of them even slightly, they will no longer fully cancel out. But now if I put it back into position, they cancel yet again. Okay, so we've now heard and seen that when you null test two identical samples at the same sample rate, they completely cancel each other out. But check this, what if I take those same two samples but downsample one of them to 44.1. Note that the second channel does have its phase inverted, and this is now all we're hearing. You'll see if I mute one of them, you'll hear the original sample again.
The difference that we are hearing here indicates what we are losing during the downsampling process. All that high end, that's the high end that's present in the 48K sample, but is missing from our 44.1 sample. That makes a substantial difference to the impact and punch of your transients and your overall mix. Okay, so now that we know which frequencies we're missing out on, let's see if we can actually hear them in the sample itself. I don't know what listening system you're on and what your hearing is like, but that is a substantial difference to me. The transient information from the 48K sample is so much more. That sample would punch through drastically more in a mix. And despite that, they're at the exact same peak level. Whereas if I was working with this 44.1 sample, my immediate reaction would be to go and boost the high end or excite it with a saturator or maybe even boost the transients with a transient shaper or something. Whereas none of that would be needed at all with the 48K sample. So this is another area when we speak about sample selection being one of the defining principles for the mixing process. It's not just about the sound of the sample. Does it sound good enough? It's about the technical aspects too. Even you may have two of the same samples, but the difference between 48K and 44.1 can be the difference between you needing three extra EQs or not. And those three extra EQs eating up your CPU, destroying your phase, creating artifacts like alias frequencies. These little things add up. Now let's perform this null test one more time, but this time we're going to pitch the samples down because this may have been a little noticeable to you at first, but oh, when you start manipulating audio, that's when the difference really starts to shine. It's as simple as a 48K file having more samples to work with, and thus the effects are less noticeable. Let's null test those same two samples again, except this time we'll pitch them down an octave. Note that both have been set to complex pro mode with the exact same settings. The only difference between them being their sample rates and that one of them has their phase flipped. That is enough frequency content that it could be a whole sample on its own. And now again, having done the null test, we know which frequencies are missing. Let's hear if we can hear them from the samples themselves without the null test. Now, again, I don't know about you, but I can hear a substantial difference between these two. This 48K version, has a lot more sizzle and bite in the top end, in the airy regions, and even a little bit more side information, it sounds like. It's got a nice stereo response. And let's see if that's picked up on something like span. I'm gonna set the time to be really fast. Okay, and for our final test to give you some actual visual proof, I've got two instances of span over here. As you can see, the one on the left is linked to the 44.1 sample, and then the one on the right is linked to the 48K sample. And now I have span here set to a mode called max, where it will measure the maximum peak frequency response here, and it will freeze there. So then once the samples have played, we can go and analyze exactly what each frequency band peaks at for each sample, and we have our proof definitively. So right off the bat, you can immediately tell that this 44.1 sample has a steeper roll off than this 48 one, which is a little bit more gradual. And you can also see this weird like dip and then boost again with these frequencies, which may be alias frequencies of some sort from the downsampling process. Whereas here it is smooth all the way up to Nyquist. Okay, so now I've given you definitive proof that a 48K file is better than a 44.1K file, but what does that actually mean for you? Well, it means you should be running your sessions at 48K for one, but here's the real kicker. I want you to go into your sample folder and identify the sample rate of all of your favorite samples. I think you'll be shocked to find just how many of them are at 44.1. You see, a lot of the old school sample vendors started off at 44.1 because that was the standard back then, but now they're locked into it and just can't change. So if you're using samples that are at 44.1, what do you do? You have one of three choices. Only produce and export at 44.1 going forward, 
that's the less fussy solution, but your mixes will be slightly worse and you're losing out on what is becoming the dominant format for distribution. Option number two would be to batch upsample your entire library with a high quality upsampler like Sox, R8 Brain, or Isotope RX. RX is by far the best of those three options, but the other two are free. I will put all of them in the description. The third option is to just stop using 44.1 samples altogether and only purchase from 48k vendors going forward, such as Airworthy Music. Link in the description. There will of course be more about this on the main channel, so subscribe there to not miss out. And if you learn something in general from this video, please leave a like. If you feel that 44.1 is better, let me know why in the comments and subscribe so you don't mix the next one from the Airworthy second channel. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll speak to you very soon.